Harvard. Um, sort of sit between psychology and computer science, working with a combination of David Parks and Fiery Cushman here. Um, <clears throat> I'm a cognitive scientist by training, but I work on computational cognitive science. So I'm particularly interested in how to understand human cognition as a type of computation, with the idea of both providing more sophisticated models of how the mind works, but also building be machines that have human-like intelligence or human-like abilities. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the work I've done on trying to understand human morality in computational terms and how we might use those principles uh, to build moral, fair, or cooperative machines. I talked here a few weeks ago in the Econ CS seminar about cooperation, and um, this is going to be completely non-overlapping. So this is uh, all different stuff. <clears throat> okay, so um, just to kind of motivate these questions, I'd like to start with this um, an old animation from Heider and Simmel, who were two social psychologists in the, in the 40s. So think about how you might describe this scene. Uh, most people won't describe this scene in a, in a literal way. They don't say, you know, the circle moved to the middle of the screen, and the triangle moved a little bit to the right, and then back, and then right, and then right, left, and then right. Instead, we describe these shapes as intentional agents with beliefs, desires, goals. You might say, one of the triangles is hiding, like the, uh, or the circle is hiding in fear, or the big triangle is a bully. You can make judgments about these characters, who's, who's good, who's evil, who's acting right and who's wrong. Um, but if you just looked at this video and downloaded this file off my computer and looked at it each frame by frame, it doesn't matter how you measure the correlations between all the pixels on the screen, you never discover that these shapes are actually agents to you. So there's a gap. There's a gap between what we observe when we look at even a very simple stimulus like this and the underlying inferences that we make. So it's not in the inferences that we make aren't in the data. And what that points to is that there must be something in our minds that's making up the difference, that allows us to make these kinds of inferences in a scene most of us have never seen before. Okay. So the goal I have is to try to understand those capabilities. And I like to start with a, with a slide that I um, saw Peter Norvig present. Um, and this is, this is you know, the basic equation of what it means to be an intelligent agent from Russell and Norvig. Uh, you know, very kind of straightforward, you have an environment, you have some utility or preferences over that environment, and you want to choose actions to maximize your, uh, an agent's utility. And so this is, in, if we think about building agents, this is the, the kind of basic equation for what a reverse engineering perspective might look like. Um, it, it needs to be written in these terms. And if we look at all the different pieces, there's perception, uh, like how do you estimate the state, what the state of the environment is, world models, how might you think about the physics and dynamics of whatever environment you're in, probabilistic reasoning, you have to take expectations when you're not sure or where there's inherent stochasticity in the environment. And then, of course, planning, like how to actually choose actions such that you can actually uh, achieve, these, um, achieve uh, high, high utility. But then there's this big part in the middle of the equation that's missing, right? So what is the utility function supposed to look like? And if we look at all the other terms I've colored in, uh, colored and put in different colors, each one of these has a different part of psychology or computer science that just studies that particular part of this equation. But what about the middle part? So, you know, we don't necessarily have, or actually may maybe now we actually do with some, some of the newer conferences, but, you know, do we have a kind of engineering study of what it means to build a moral or fair machine, and then how might we understand different aspects of human morality and to help us guide th that approach? So I'm going to tell, tell you guys about three projects today. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. I'd love this to be a you know, small group. I'd love it to be a discussion. So you know, if you interrupt a lot and we have a, have a good discussion, we won't get to the end, but that's fine. Um, and I want to start by telling you about some work we've done, in particular on, on learning moral theories and how agents might learn uh, in an effective way to make general moral decisions. I'll then talk a little bit about fairness, and in particular, fairness as a kind of impartiality. So how we make inferences about what others will think about us and anticipate those inferences in order to guide our notions of what it means to be fair in a dynamic and context-sensitive way. And then finally, how we make inferences about intentions um, under just sparse and often noisy information, and in particular, how we differentiate between intended and uh, intended impacts of our actions and side effects of our actions. Okay. So <clears throat> let me start with this idea of a common sense moral theory. So what do I even mean when I say learning a moral theory? Well, it's really a basic system that we use every day in our life. So how do we trade off the welfare of other people? So we have to trade off our own interests and those of others, our friends, family, group, larger society, <clears throat> people who have been good to us and good to others, or people we've never met and will never meet again. So 
these are all these different kinds of trade-offs that we're, we grapple with on a, on a basically daily basis. But the challenge here is that this is a problem for learning. So we know that societies in different places, in different eras, have differed in how they judged one should make these moral trade-offs. So for example, in some societies, you might see nepotism as a type of corruption. In others, it might be seen as a kind of moral obligation. So what kind of a monster would hire uh, a stranger instead of their brother? That, that seems insane. <clears throat> and then I, I have a, a little quote from Trump here, or you see the diversity of moral values. It says, I like nepotism. You know, a lot of people say, oh, nepotism. Usually these are people without children. So you can kind of even see this kind of wide variety of moral values, even within a particular place. Different values of group loyalty versus impartiality, all very relevant today. And even then within a society, there's lots of different kinds of uh, standards for making these kinds of trade-offs. And because of this large-scale diversity, both within and across cultures, within and across communities, this is a challenge for learning. It means we most likely do not have an innate sense of you know, what, how one should make these trade-offs. We have to learn it in a culturally appropriate way. So this is a challenge for learning. <clears throat> So I start off with a very kind of a, a, a basic notion of how we might think about representing a moral theory. And the idea is to kind of draw on work done by uh, many philosophers, such as um, Rawls and Herka, who talked about there are some basic goods. So base goods, uh, primary goods, these are moral foundations. These could be kind of the primitive things of, of morality, like welfare. Um, and the idea is to kind of abstract over what it means for a kind of a quantity to be moral and just to be able to talk about it directly. So, what I'm showing here is sort of the most basic morality you could have. It says that agent I gets value from uh, itself. The only thing it cares about is the value that it gets from itself. But then when, what's interesting about humans is that we have this ability to recursively value others. So we don't just value ourselves, but we can value the values of other people. So what that means is we can say, well, I value myself with some, some trade-off, but I also, with some weight, value other people. Um, and this, in a way, can describe all kinds of different moral values, right? So um, it also shows, in a simple way, how these kinds of different values can come into conflict. So for example, um, you know, you could think about this as formalizing morality as an obligation to treat others as they would wish to be treated, right? Because you're taking their utility function and putting into your utility function in this recursive way. But it also points to this kind of conflict, you know, where uh, if I'm only thinking about myself, um, who is going to be for me, but if I'm only for myself, who am I, right? So you want to take care of yourself, but also take care of others, and you do this in a sort of principled way. Okay, so how might we, so the challenge, if you think about this from a learning perspective, is to just learn all those alpha parameters, right? I have my weight on myself, and then I just need to learn an alpha for every other person in, uh, in the world. And so that sounds bad, right? There's a lot of people in the world, so I don't want to learn a new alpha parameter for every single pair of people, right? So that's how, so it's actually a pair. So it's alpha ij, meaning if I'm agent j, how much do I value, uh, if I'm agent i, how much do I value agent j? The other challenge is that it doesn't have any, or the other problem with this is that it doesn't give you any ability to generalize to any kind of new individual. So if I, even if I learn, say, to value my sister very highly because, you know, because I love her or for whatever reason or because she's kin, that doesn't say anything about my brother. So, but, but you might think there's more principles that actually tell us how to do this valuation, that it's not just values over individuals. And so what we've done is introduce a, a kind of a broad approach in, in computational cognitive science, this idea, and, and, and of course machine learning, this idea by adding abstraction, you enable generalization. So, and in particular, you want to add the right kinds of human-like abstractions. And so in this particular case, we we hypothesize that a set of abstract moral principles could explain many types of generalization that people have. So in addition to just valuing yourself, as I showed you before, you'd also value, you can have a, basically a feature-based approach. So are you in my kin? Are you in my in-group? Broadly defined, but observable. But then also these other types of uh, valuation where it's not actually observable directly from some feature in the environment. So if I have a reciprocal relationship just directly with you, that means that I might value you more than others, say, if we're friends or we're business partners. Or if we have an indirect, recipro like an indirect reci uh, reciprocity-like relationship where, so, you know, I want to um, uh, value those who, are, who also value, value the good people, and we're all the good people in a kind of circular way that you can, you can uh, work with. And, and just kind of thinking about these as the parochial values, these are like kin and in-group, these are these more tribal, um, uh, self-oriented values and versus these impartial values of just valuing all people or value those who are good to others. So what might this look like? And, and what I'm going to show you in this project is really um, 
a suite of simulations based on this representation and based on some learning machinery that I haven't introduced yet, which I'm going to in a bit. So let me start by thinking about like what, is, what does an agent look like? Well, they basically just look like, so this is agent, agent index zero, and the uh, darker the square, the more weight they put on one of those principles. And just to, I think there was a last bit here, how do you then get an alpha? Well, you take the weight of the principle, whether that principle is active for that particular pair of agents, um, times some plus some constant if there is one, so which you can think of as just a particular attachment towards a particular individual. So here's what a particular agent might look like in this level of values. They have just a few parameters. Here's a whole little society of 20 agents, and here's what their different relational uh, their different relational um, features look like. So uh, every two are kin. Ev there's kind of two groups, an in-group and an out-group. Um, there's a scattering of just individual friendships and direct relationships, and then there's one big group of the good people, and, uh, um, uh, and then there's those who are not. And n neither of these are necessarily observable if you, they're observable if you're in the society, but if you're coming, say, as a new child into this world, you don't see that. Okay, so then this is the equation I showed before. How do you then get the alpha as well? It's just, it's, you're basically just taking the weights that you put over those principles and whether those principles are there, and now we have this whole little world showing all these different, so, so it's like, you know, basically, n squared in terms of number of agents of how to value each other person. So how might learning work? So here we're inspired again by kind of the cognitive science of how children might actually learn their moral values. And the insight is that they often might only observe adults making decisions and judgments about what the adults consider to be morally appropriate trade-offs. So children, we know this from developmental data sets, and uh, is, they very rarely get direct feedback on, at the level of principles. So there are some, sometimes you do get, uh, get, get data, like you know, family first, but oftentimes not in a precise way that you could trade it off with others. But we do get a lot of noisy data from other people acting in morally appropriate ways. And so, and, and it, in particular, it's challenging because what's often called the poverty of stimulus in language learning. So moral learning, like language learning, um, requires children to make inferences that go beyond the data. So, for example, let's see. We see this man being nice to this person. Is he being ni uh, a person who's, who's in need? Is he being nice because he just values all people and he would help anyone? Is he helping this person because maybe they're both white and he values he's got some like in-group bias? Is it because they're both Americans? I mean, we have all many different hypotheses about why this helping behavior occurred. And the challenge of moral learning for a child is to figure out why that why that helping behavior had so that they can then learn their own moral values. Okay. And what's incredible about this moral system is that we can make all kinds of complicated moral judgments in cases that we've never been in. They're complete hypotheticals, philosophical thought puzzles, and the like. So how might we do this kind of learning even when the data that we get only noisily and indirectly represents the underlying principles? And here we took uh, a kind of a general approach which I built on in, in uh, a lot of my work and it's going to appear in all the, the pieces of this talk. This idea of Bayesian theory of mind. So the idea is that um, if agents select, actually, let me play this out a little bit more. Okay, so if agents select, uh, let's build this, yeah, okay, good. So, so what we want to do is we want to go from people taking actions in mor morally relevant contexts and infer what were their underlying values. We want to infer this, if you're, this is the goal, to get this back uh, from just a bunch of uh, uh, actions that people took. And what we can assume, what the key, one of the key assumptions is that agents choose actions roughly proportional in this kind of soft max way to the expected utility of those actions. So that's the way that these kind of indirectly reflect the principles. And then to make this inference work, you have to have some prior on principles. And the more structure that goes into the prior, the faster you'll be able to learn. So here we assumed a hierarchical prior where you can, you can sort of see it a little bit here, where groups shared similar moral values, but in a very noisy way. So the idea being that if you learn about one group, you can then make generalizations to that group as well. Okay, so we can write this as a hierarchical model, where a uh, hierarchical uh, graphical model, where agents are taking actions, and this is what the learner observes, and they have to make inferences about all of these. So from these actions, they make inferences about alphas, which give them data about um, what are the weights on those principles, what moral relations do people have, those indirect and direct reciprocity relationships, and then finally, what are the what are, you can also learn the priors. You know, what do the uh, how does each group as an average um, weight these principles? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, I'm going to get it exactly the, this, the, the way in which moral learning and moral change might interplay with each other. Uh, so hold that. But just to preview it, um, one thing you might want to explain is to say, well, um, is to say, well, is the way in which we see morals change over time, is that a function of just the kind of inferences that we make and the biases in those inference processes? Or is it the, is it the result of something else? And I'll try to say something about that process uh, in a little bit. And I think part of the reason why I think it's something else is that it's very important for cultural learners to be able to faithfully and with high fidelity reproduce the previous generation. So if any statistical bias is going to very, very rapidly lead to just that bias dominating. Okay. So, okay, so here's the, the kind of the setup. Um, we generated a bunch of decisions from each of these agents. So each agent made a bunch of decisions, helping, hindering, uh, being selfish with, with the others. And then a learner comes in and needs to learn this, uh, you know, basically this matrix of weights. So, um, okay. So, okay, right. So here's what uh, a learner might infer. And you can see that even with just a small amount of data, they can do a pretty good job. But if you bias, so, so one, of, one of the things we did in this project was we biased the data to be more toward, so a learner didn't get to see everybody uniformly. They only got to see some agents just a few times, like their outgroup, and some agents a lot, their in-group, and then a few agents like a ton. It's like their parents, maybe. And so they do a very good job learning their parents' values, but less so the outgroup values. But because they can learn these group priors, they can kind of get the collective right a bit. And as the agents get more and more training data, um, they can you know, obviously learn uh, more effectively. Okay. So this is just to show that this, um, this inference procedure does quite a good job of being able to infer kind of the ground truth morality from, um, from these sparse observations. Okay. Um, cool. So, I talked about how agents might infer the moral values that other agents have. But how do they actually set their own moral values? And I think this gets to what, uh, part of what David was talking about. So, well, clearly, once you've inferred the values of others, now you have a really good thing to do, right? You could align your values with the values of others. So in this next little part, I want to talk about these two questions. So how might a learner decide whose values and to, to copy, let's say, and how? And then what other forces might be at play that might account for different kinds of dynamics of moral values over time? OK, so here is our kind of inference um, paradigm. And I wanted to add, and we, so what we did is we added in this third piece. Um, and this was really motivated heavily by uh, cognitive psychology and philosophy. But this idea that there's other reasons to value people besides just you have a, because you have a moral principle. And so all of these, this could be you have a, just a love attachment, you feel empathy for them, you have just social contact, this is this old social psychology theory, you've read a story about that person. All of these things might lead you to value a particular individual more than your moral theory tells you. So just to give you a, sa a few salient examples to think about as, we, as I talk about this, you can imagine um, a, a famous example from literature described in philosophy is um, Huck Finn feeling a special attachment for the slave Jim, and he has no moral principle which says, I should treat this black man in a moral way, but he just develops this friendship just through their experiences together. You can also imagine, um, imagine a, a, a homophobic father whose son comes out as gay, and they feel this love for their son, but there's still this moral principle, which is telling them maybe not to value them in a, in a high way. So those are ways I wish I want to say there's ways in which we just care about people that, go, that don't necessarily, um, can't be described in our moral principles, and, but they can be important morally. OK. So let's talk about this first idea. So how might we first just align our values to those of others to get this cultural um, moral learning going? So if we start off with a, uh, so, so the idea is to give moral learners two motivations to acquire moral theories. And the first is called, this, the first one we call external alignment. And the idea is that you want to value, so this is a motivation, so it's a utility function that a learner has. You want to value, so meaning you want to set your weights, the learner wants to set their weights over their values such that they have the values, this is the, so this is, they want to minimize the difference between their values and the values of others, where but others proportional to how much they value those others. So value the values of those that you value. That's the idea. Okay. And to kick that off, you start off by really valuing one or two people a lot, maybe like your parents, and start from there. Okay. So 
these alpha parameters end up forming, performing this sort of dual, dual role. They're both the target of inference, they're the thing you want to infer when you're learning about the moralities of others, but they're also, they can drive the acquisition of moral knowledge through this external alignment process. So here's what this looks like. Um, so that's what the values of the, the um, kind of, care, that, that kind of primitive attachment are. And you can see that, that when that uh, phi parameter is very high, or pretty high, you get a pretty close match to them. As it's, oh, yeah, there we go. So then, and when it's lower, you kind of average over everybody because you're kind of spreading out your moral values over the whole society. But when you have it very high, you kind of directly just copy and then there's someone in between. Okay. And then this is just to quickly say something about you know, this idea that David brought up of where do new moral ideas come from. And external alignment, and I'll show you some simulations, can, is gonna, this kind of mechanism will tend to propagate existing moral theories. It can't explain where new moral ideas come from, especially if no one in the previous generation valued those. So, but we're confronted with the challenge of explaining rapid moral change. So for example, in just a few generations, um, same-sex marriage has become, gone from, uh, I think what you're seeing here is, uh, attitude towards gay marriage, it goes from you know, basically everyone thinking it's unacceptable in 1900 to almost everybody thinking it is acceptable in 1990. You have very, a similar uh, effect happening with um, uh, transgender people. This is uh, from a really interesting science paper in 2016 where they measured people's changes in prejudice towards transgender people after just a single 10 minute conversation with a transgendered person, individual. So we're clearly capable of rapid moral change that isn't going to be due just to kind of long-term drift over inference. So the idea is to pose a second mechanism, not just that we externally align our values to others, but that we internally align our values to be consistent with, our, with those attachments, with those feelings and um, emotions. So these are the two examples that I, that I gave to try to motivate this. And again, this is this, these five parameters. Okay, so here's how we encoded that formally. We talk we, uh, so we describe the difference between um, the difference between how much you value that person and how much your moral theories tell you to value that person. And if there's a gap, that means there's some feeling that you have that's unexplained. And so this is a motivation, it's a utility function that motivates individuals to acquire theories that are consistent. So here's what th that might look like in response to different kinds of attachments. So, this is the base case that we were looking at before, where the learner just only really cares about their caregiver, so they just copy their moral theory exactly. But then you could imagine, say, well, let's say I form this attachment with someone else who is in my in-group. And you can see what this motivation does is it starts, it leads to this somewhat expansion. So this person only mostly valued kin, but now they value group more than kin. Because you're, you have to explain, well, why am I valuing this group member more? Well, maybe it's not that I just value kin, I value group more. Or um, when you form an outgroup attachment, you shift your moral values to be this about a kind of a larger reciprocity concept. And then this is, if, and then the, the attachment where you, you love someone who's not even a good person, this is like loving the sinner, right? So you said, well, you know, maybe we just need to value all people. You love, uh, love the sin, kind of hate the sinner type concept. One of the challenges with, with this idea, though, is that it can go backwards. If you form an attachment in a negative way, you can kind of make your theory more and more parochial. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show you very quickly some of how these different um, motivations for acquisition and change um, lead to different kinds of moral dynamics. Okay, so we start off with a society that is heavily weighting the kin and in-group uh, moral uh, weight, uh, principles. And each generation, now this is happening over, over time, not just one generation, they observe a bunch of data from the previous generation, make inferences, and we repeat. And what I'm just showing here is the average weight put on the two kind of, kind of clustered into the parochial and the impartial um, uh, principles. And you can just basically, the point here is just, it's stable. This is good. Cultural learning is working. It's, uh, uh, agents are able to learn what the, the previous generation knew. But once you add in some of these cross-group attachments, these you know, these emotional attachments, you can start to get very rapid moral change. So even if just 15% of the agents form one attachment out of their group, they can, uh, their, the, the moral theories can change in just a few generations. And the more that happens, uh, or the less that happens, affects the rate of change. But if you form those attachments within your group, that happens much slower. So you can see the same percentage of, of extra attachments. It depends on who you're forming those attachments with. Okay. So, Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Okay, so I described kind of a general approach to moral learning, introduced this idea of being able to use Bayesian inference through a structured hierarchical model to infer the latent moral the uh, theories of others. 
And I think, I, in general, I, I hope that this can give some insights into the kind of cause and dynamics of moral change across time. And we've already started to use this framework for studying both human behavior, so how people make these kinds of um, moral trade-offs where they're trading off between different principles, and to, to explain um, the kinds of decisions that people make. Just want to point to some other work I did with um, uh, Richard Kim, who was a master's student, on applying this framework to the moral machine data set. This was a large-scale online data set collected of people making hypothetical judgments about what a self-driving car should or shouldn't do in a variety of different cases with all kinds of different characters. So this is kind of, in some ways, a perfect fit for our approach where you have this big set of features that you can attach principles to. And what I'm showing here is just the uh, uh, predictive accuracy of a bunch of different approaches. Um, the green line is uh, the, the full hierarchical model. These are all lesioned versions of that hierarchical model that have less structure. And the idea, what's showing here is that the more that as we add this kind of structure into the model, we're actually able to capture the kinds of inferences that people make. And just from even a few data points, we're able to make pretty good, uh, pretty good predictions about what someone would do in a situation that the model has never seen before. Okay. All right. So I want to. In the second part, I'm going to extend this to think about this, this framework in some way um, to go beyond just trade-offs where I'm thinking about me versus you or us versus them, but also to think about kind of the relative valuation. So it's not just about um, who do I value more, but kind of we might care about, about fairness, like who's getting what and how, in what proportions. And this is work I did with Alex Shaw and uh, Josh Tannenbaum during my PhD. Okay, so. So I, showed, I introduced this something that looked like this, basically, a linear sum over different parameters. But this is only going to allow, this isn't going to let us allow, uh, enable us to model the kinds of differences in outcome that fairness seems to uh, care about. Um, and we know that uh, we don't just care about who gets what, but we also care about the distribution, so things like equity. But in addition to equity, there's lots of evidence that we don't just care about, uh, th that in addition to how much people get, we care about what our behavior says about us. So how those action, how those allocations, what what those say about our, our underlying values. And you can think about this as a kind of reputation, or we want to be seen as being a good person. We want to be seen as impartial, competent, virtuous, generous. And um, this has often been called this kind of equity efficiency trade-off. It permeates um, all kinds of economics and philosophy. Uh, the general idea is that cooperation can enlarge the, the size of the pie, but how do we split it fairly? There's been many ideas. I'm going to, you know, there's one, this idea of efficiency, just maximize total welfare. Another, minimize the difference between equals. This is kind of, I'm associating these two with kind of Harsani and Rawls. But there's many variants that I'm not going to do, a, I'm not doing at all justice to the richness of work in this area because I want to, I want to kind of pinpoint a, ver, a kind of particular phenomenon that we identified. So, and which is the way that equity and efficiency can trade off in ways that I think are not intuitive to either of these kinds of theories, which only look at outcomes. So, so there's two types of, of, uh, of equity. So one is you could think of um, a kind of efficient equity. So imagine Alice has two slices of pie and Bob has none. So what would efficient equity look like? Well, it would look like Alice gives one slice to Bob. Now the world's just as efficient as it was, but it's also more equitable. There's also a, an inefficient kind of equity in this problem, where Alice just could throw both slices in the trash. So now everyone's just as e equally well off, but it's much less efficient. Okay. And one of the interesting things, as my collaborator Alex Shaw showed, was that young children will actually do things like this. In order to preserve equity, they'll throw away resources. So if they have an extra resource, they won't allocate it. They'll, they'll get rid of it because they don't want to be impartial, uh, is the theory. Okay. So that's, that's the hypothesis, that a preference for fairness, and in particular this inefficient equity, might be driven by an aversion to being seen as inappropriately partial. And I'm going to show using some computational techniques how that simple insight can actually lead us, enable us to explain lots of different interesting uh, fair phenomena. But to, to kind of show how kind of common sense these ideas are, I have a little clip from Sesame Street, which hopefully will work. Let's see. Two uh, pieces of apple pie, Bert. Would uh, you like a piece of apple pie? Oh, boy, would I? Yes, yes, please. Mm. Oh, OK. Uh, let's see. Let me just um, mm -mm. look at these for a minute. Uh, OK, Smell Bert. Smell that apple pie. Yeah, you, you take that piece there, Bert, and I'll take this piece here. Uh, excuse me, Ernie, uh, uh, but... Uh, Ernie, you gave me the small piece. Well, well, that's true, Bert. That is the small piece there, and this is the big piece, and I gave you that piece, and I think I'll keep the big piece myself. Ernie, that is not very polite. Well, well how do you mean, Bert? Well, I, I mean, uh, if I had two pieces of pie, mm -hmm. I'd offer you the big piece and take the small one for myself. Well, well Bert, hmm? you have the small piece, Bert. 
<laughs> okay, so, so what does Bert understand that Ernie doesn't? And this is, this is a nice uh, little demo, but really these ideas go back to um, our early work from Amartya Sen on choice theory. Um, so Bert understands that when you make a choice, you have to consider what the choice is going to lead others to infer about you, right? Ernie's only thinking about the outcome, right? Okay, so, so, um, so what you're doing when you're learning different kinds of values, you're, you have to learn to do these things in the right way. It's not so simple. Okay, so let me give you a sense of the kind of paradigm we, we use to study this both behaviorally and with models. Here, I'm gonna, in this study, I'm gonna, in the next studies, if I have time for both, there, we actually did real uh, experiments. They're not just simulations. So this is an office place context. So you have the boss, Princess Peach, and her two workers, Mario and Luigi. And uh, you know, they both did a really great job. And uh, she can decide to give either, she has these prizes to give out. So she can give either, uh, so she has one $1,000 gift card and two $100 gift cards. And she can give either one of the $1,000 gift cards to one uh, and an $100 gift card to the other, or she could give the $100 gift cards to both. And so she thinks, well, they both did a pretty good job, basically the same, no reason to differentiate based on that. You know, she cares about efficiency, she really values her employees, she wants to give out as many bonuses as possible. So she's thinking, well, basically indifferent between giving the thousand to Mario and giving the thousand to Luigi. But then she's thinking, and then here's, here's Donkey Kong, and he's gonna try to make an inference. So he's thinking, you know, what does Peach think? And so, so, so we're thinking, well, so for Peach was indifferent, so she just gave, decided to give the thousand dollar one to, to Luigi in this case. So Peach was indifferent, and now, now Donkey Kong's thinking, well, well, Peach probably likes Luigi better than Mario. That's, that's more likely, because why else would she have chosen uh, Luigi to get the, the larger reward? But Peach is quite sophisticated, so she's thinking, well, I don't, wanna, I don't want Don these other people to think the wrong thing about my underlying values. So this is not gonna work, right? So she's gonna think, well, I value them equally and I want them to be, I wanna be seen, I want that value to be known, so I'm gonna actually give them both the $100 gift card, and now everything's good. So the only reason to explain that would be that they're, they're equal, okay. And of course, it's not just that she cares about what an external observer thinks, she also might care about what they think, like if, I mean, this is the problem, anyone who's worked with, um, uh, you know, worked with others, it's like impartiality is really important. Um, she also might just care about her own values, right, and not want others to think the wrong things about her and just to uphold the norms that she holds dear. Okay, so how do we model a sophisticated peach? And we're gonna build up that to a sophisticated peach who can do this kind of reputational reasoning uh, by starting with a basic model. So we're gonna start with, um, with Ernie, the like, he's only thinking about outcomes. And what I'm using here is a, um, an influence diagram, it's not super important that you follow it in this part of the talk, but I use these in, this, in the last part as well. But in general, I'll just give you a sketch. There's an action that's a square. So uh, influence diagram is a generalization of a Bayesian network in addition to modeling different kinds of events and the probabilities, the conditional probabilities of those events. A influence diagram um, enables you to model a probabilistic decision problem. So uh, it, it includes two more types of nodes. So the ovals or circles here are just like before. They're, they're um, events or uh, attributes of the world. And the squares are different, they're actions. So the agent gets to choose how to set those nodes. And the diamonds are utilities. So those are different real value numbers that the agent gets depending on what, how things turn out. And so the challenge of a decision maker here is to pick actions that maximize their, uh, the utility that they're gonna get. So standard, everything's standard. Okay, so here's one version of a utility problem. So they have a, you're trying to optimize expected utility. And you have sort of two terms. This is very similar to what we had in the previous part. You want to maximize efficiency. So like, you know, you value these other agents and you want to, if you value them at all positively, you want to give out everything. But then you also care about inequity. So inequity I'm d is, I want to be clear, differentiating between inequity and impartiality. Inequity here just means those who did the same, who, who are equally meritous, get the same amount. So if they both did like, an, had equally good, uh, equally good um, evaluations at work, these are all gonna be in an office context, um, then they should, then this term will be uh, satisfied when um, they get the same amount and it will be, it will grow uh, to the extent they don't get the same amount. And like before, we're gonna assume that decision makers make decisions subject to a soft max so that they're uh, approximately trying to optimize these, um, uh, uh, their utility in these contexts. Okay, so what might this look like? So same context that I showed you before, right? So you have an unequal allocation where you can give a thousand to one and a hundred to the other. And what I'm varying on the x-axis is how big the equal allocation is. So it could be, you could give 
1,000 to one and 100 to the other, or zero to both, or 500 to both, or 1,000 to both, or 1,200 to both. Okay, so these are the, the all kinds of different things. And what you can see is, in this decision-making thing that I showed, there is a preference for some amount of equity, but as the equal bonus grows, you're more likely to want to give that out. In particular, once the bonus gets around above 500 each, then you, of course you prefer the equal bonus because it satisfies both the equity and efficiency. But below there, you prefer the unequal, unequal bonus pretty strongly. Okay. So let's see if we can build, so, so the goal is then to start with this and build up to get this sophisticated and, uh, reputation reasoner. And the idea is, again, this idea of theory of mind is a kind of inverse decision making. So what we're doing is we want to infer um, whether or not someone was partial, whether they valued one agent more than the other in a potentially inappropriate way. Um, and what this is saying, so there's some influence of partiality on how the agent might value the others. So again, these alpha terms of how agents value each other. And then, again, this is just rational action. And there's some prior on, on partiality, which is essentially uniform for this, this case. And now when we look at the same setting, we can look at the inferences that one might, an observer might make about a, a decision maker. And so here I'm showing, well, what inference about partiality would an observer make if they choose the equal allocation, and it's, of course it's zero. And what inference of partiality would they make if the unequal allocation was chosen? And you can see as the unequal, as the equal option gets better and better and better for everybody, you're seen as more partial when you choose the unequal allocation. Okay, so now we can get to Bert, this impartiality reasoner. And here, so Bert kind of inherits, and what I'm trying to show with these nested influence diagrams is the way that this kind of build, these agent models build recursively on top of each other is you have some term for equity and efficiency, just like the base decision maker, it inherits those preferences, but this new term, which says you actually have a value over the anticipated inferences that others will make. So this is the probability that my action will be seen as partial by someone doing this inference, uh, times some, some weight of how much I care about being impartial. And now when we add that on to this graph, right, so now this gray is this kind of, I call it a constructed preference because you're constructing it out of, of an inference. Um, there's a higher preference for equality even when it's very inefficient. Okay. So what we did to study this empirically is we basically gave people a large set of these different kind of vignettes. It's essentially the same as the Peach case I gave you, but it wasn't with uh, Nintendo characters, it was with boring people. And, um, but the same thing would happen. You know, you're the boss, uh, or there's a boss, how do, you, how do you judge the partiality, and what do you think they should do? And one interesting thing, and these were all hypothetical, so there, there was no incentives, it was just, these were just hypothetical decisions. Um, so in the case where the equal bonus was zero dollars, people were, 50% of people were wanted to, would rather, said they would rather give zero dollars to both than give 100 to one and 1,000 to another. So already in our data we're replicating what we saw in children, that agents will at least in this case hypothetically, choose to waste resources um, in order to maintain equity. And then in the inferences they made, when someone gave the unequal bonus, they were judged as being quite, um, quite partial. When um, the equal bonus was $100, so this is still pretty wasteful, 75% um, chose to give the 100 to both rather than give the unequal bonus, wasting $900. Um, and again, those, those inferences still stayed the same. And what we've now did is we, are, is we can, look at our model predictions, and our model, so in that, and that's showed in gray, and our model's predicting that, that jump between these two, um, these two amounts of the equal bonus, and when we fill it out for a bunch of different values, again, the model's capturing some of, some of the key trends, kind of, as this, go, this goes up, the model makes, as the size of the equal bonus goes up, the model's more likely to choose the equal bonus as our people, and as the size of the equal bonus goes up, there's some increase in the amount of partiality people have, um, or infer on someone who chose the unequal one. Okay. But now let's look at a, a different case, because we have all these different terms and parameters, so we want to try to get as much mileage out of this model as we can. So let's look at the case where one employee received a better, a better work evaluation. And here you might think, well, actually the fair thing to do is to give the bigger bonus. Now you have a good reason to give somebody the $1,000, right? Okay, so, so what we're seeing here is in the equal bonus case, um, uh, so the fair bonus here means giving the large, the large amount to the person who got the better evaluation, and the equal bonus is just giving them both the same. Um, and so what's interesting here is that even in the case where uh, you could give 1,100 to both, 
many participants still gave 1,000 to one and 100 to the other because it was important to maintain equity in some sense. And our model makes the same prediction as well as making predictions about the inferences of partiality that participants made, both for these kind of extreme cases but also for all the different gradations in between. Okay, so one thing you might be concerned with is, well, in this case, the agents are always choosing what the outcome is. There's no, so whatever they intend is what happens. And one thing that way that can get interesting is the way you could be very unequal, but potentially still very impartial, and that's by introducing aspects of pr uh, procedural randomness, or this is sometimes called procedural fairness. And so if we add the option, well, what if Peach can flip a coin to determine who gets the big bonus? Uh, you might think, well, that's fine, because no one's gonna, even though the outcome might be unequal, no one's gonna think, well, she had a preference for one, one of them over the other. Okay, so when we add this option to flip the coin, um, people will uh, shift their preferences towards the ability to kind of signal impartiality by flipping the coin. Uh, and again, the model made the, the associated predictions. But once, but you can, again, you can see this, this kind of the, inequi the equity aspect kicking in. As soon as it's possible to guarantee a fair, uh, a fair outcome, people switch to that. And our model makes that switch at the right point as well. When we correlate all the decisions and judgments did with the model, we find a relatively high fit between the kinds of in inferences and decisions that people make, as well as our model does. And when we compare that to a lesioned model, say a model that doesn't have that recursive theory of mind built in, it does uh, significantly worse at predicting out of sample um, decisions that people make. Okay. Um, okay, and then I just wanna point to a little bit of work I did um, uh, collaborating with uh, Jack Sow and Mazarin Banaji in psychology here, looking at not just fairness in terms of resource allocations, but also fairness versus accuracy. And this has been uh, an important topic in um, uh, you know, fairness in technological systems. This was a, an example that motivated our, our work. Uh, you put into Google Translate a language, this is Turkish, where there are no um, gendered pronouns, I believe. So it first says, Orbir Doktor, Orbir Hemsir. And Google Translate uses kind of the statistical base rates and gives you this very gendered uh, inference about what uh, the language is. And so we looked at this in two different concept, in two different ways, looking at how um, people use group differences when making judgments about um, specific individuals and how um, the base rates can kind of intrude on those judgments in, um, in ways that undermine fairness. And then also the ways that showing that people do make judgments that are consistent with the kinds of Bayesian rationality, but when those judgments, similar to this Google Translate case, reveal a potential latent uh, unfairness or sexism or something like that, people are um, quick to condemn others for making those inferences. So showing that we, we are doing this kind of sophisticated second order reasoning, both about what, when we make decisions or even make judgments about accuracy, this is, these were all in the accuracy domain, we're also revealing things about our, our own uh, uh, moral values. Okay. But I'm not gonna say more about these, They're, these papers are out. Okay. Um, okay, great have time to do this last bit. I'm gonna go quick. This is some older work um, I did uh, with um, uh, Toby Gersenberg and Josh Tenenbaum, but then also recently with um, Joe Halpern, where we um, made it even uh, quite a bit more formal. I don't think in these slides I have the most, the, the full formalism, because there's not enough time, but I'm gonna give you a sketch of how this works. Okay, so how intentions and side effects. So I think, I hope everyone here is familiar with like a trolley problem dilemma. Train's out of control, it's going towards five people. Can you flip the switch? It's gonna kill those five people, but if you flip the switch, it'll just kill one. Is it okay to do the, to flip the switch? Most people say, yes. Why? You're killing the one, isn't killing wrong? No, it's okay. We have these, going back to Aquinas, we have these, this idea of the doctrine of double effect. This is this kind of moral rule that it's been thought to explain interesting aspects of moral cognition. And the idea is pretty simple, there's a few clauses. The foreseen bad, if an action is okay, if the foreseen bad outcome is not intended and the good outcome is intended, so check, right? You wanted to, you intended to save those guys, you didn't intend to kill those, that guy. Um, there's no way to produce the good outcome without also producing the bad outcome, and the bad outcome's not disproportionate. So like, you know, we're saving more people, we didn't intend the bad outcome. So this is the idea of the doctrine of double effect, but how can we understand this uh, as a model of the mind? And in part, the reason why this is challenging is because of a puzzle that, uh, that we identified. So, Doctrine of double effect is an example, but we have all of these absolute moral theories. Utilitarianism, different kinds of moral rules, structures of blame in, 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 kind of psych in psychology, doctrine of double effect like the one I just introduced. But when we actually measure people's judgment about whether an action is morally permissible, 
we get something like this. And so this is actually from the studies I'm going to show you, but this is just all the data. Uh, each one of these is a different scenario. And you can see this is, there's basically no black and white rule that's going to be able to explain people's intuitions because people are highly variable and, gra and graded. There are things that are more or less OK. And recently, Bertram Molly, a, a prominent uh, social psychologist, said you know, a major limitation to, to these models that people have proposed in psychology and really all models of moral judgment is that they don't generate any quantitative predictions. So our goal and this reverse engineering approach, can we build a quantitative theory of, of these kinds of uh, moral judgments? So OK, inspired by the doctrine of double effect, sketch out a simple way of capturing that formally. So the, the general idea is that there's two reasons why an action can be can be judged wrong or impermissible. It could, be cause, it could cause harm. You can't do that. You don't want to cause harm. You can intend harm. Definitely don't want to do that. And definitely bad to intend and cause harm. But, there's some, but the doctrine of double effect basically says you can carve some things out, right? So you can cause harm if you did it with an intention to save. That's like that trolley problem I showed you. So we can think about this as, well, this is like a noisy or approach, right? So, so an action is impermissible if um, it was done with the intention to harm or without the intention, with the intention to save. The other reason why an action might, causing harm might be OK is if it really minimized the total amount of harm caused. So maybe there's some idea of like you, you raise the overall net utility of the situation. And then you can combine these in a, in a noisier way. So an action can be impermissible if you caused harm without an intention to save or you didn't appropriately minimize the total cause harm. OK. But this is very, very simple. It's just supposed to be kind of a rough version of what uh, the doctrine of double effect prescribes. But this doesn't, this doesn't, this can't capture the full kind of cognitive or inference challenge because you don't observe intentions. You have to infer them. So you know where this is going. But here it's a little bit more subtle because here what I mean by intentions is actually something a little bit uh, more sophisticated than just some parameter that drove the judgment. So, and in particular, um, in particular, the idea is that intentions are a kind of mental causation. So when you ask what was the intention, you're asking what caused the agent to make her choice. And so if you're an asking a causal question, our theory or idea was, well, maybe we can use the tools of causal, inf of causal identification and causal inference, i.e. counterfactuals, to reason about the causal factors to under uh, which drove an agent to make a particular decision. Um, so in causation, the cause and effect explains the reason the effect happened. In intention, the cause of a choice explains the reason ag agent made that choice. Okay, so we're going to use influence diagrams to represent a choice problem. So uh, actions are rectangles, outcomes are ovals, utilities are diamonds. Okay, so great, we have a uh, structured representation of a, a structured formal representation of this trolley problem, and we can fill it all in, right? So we can say, well, what action would maximize utility? Throwing the switch would be yes, right? Because we can we can do this simulation and think, well, if I threw it. I'd save all these people. That's good. And from this, you can then also compute what are the foreseen outcomes. So what, what outcomes do you foresee happening if you, for, if you throw the switch? And it, you foresee that the train would go down the sidetrack, that it would hit and kill that guy. It would not hit and kill those people. And the key idea, which was, which was inspired from work on intention from Michael Bratman, is that a foreseen outcome is intended if the agent's plan counterfactually depends on the outcome. And now, he doesn't talk about it in that language. He talks about it in this language of partial planning and commitment. But I think you'll see why this captures a key aspect of Bratman's idea of partial plans. Um, so how, do we, how might we compute these kind of counterfactuals? Well, one thing we can say was, well, uh, kind of thinking about this as like a, think about this as like a kind of a do calculus, right? Well, if we can fix this part of the graph, so no matter what, that agent's going to die. No matter what you do, would you still flip the switch? Yeah, right? Because you'd save the five. It's even better. Like, sounds great. You can imagine the guy not being there. So given that your, your action was not pivotal, was not counterfactually dependent on those outcomes, you would have done it anyway, they're not an intention. They're not intended, even though they're foreseen. And here, well, what if no matter what you did, those people were not going to die, right? Because you're intervening on the graph. Um, you, what would you do? Would you still flip the switch? Definitely not. You just let it go, and that guy's going to live. So it's, it's great, right? OK, so because there's counterfactual dependence, th those are intended. Now, the reason to introduce all of this formalism is that, and it may not be super obvious from this example, but in many cases, what's counterfactually dependent is actually overdetermined. 
And so we need to use this machinery to deal with cases where there's all kinds of different minimality conditions, and, and I have to refer you to the paper for that, because all of this is going to be in the inner loop of an inference scheme. What we observe is the action. Moral permissibility depends on the intention, but the way that, that intentions are formed is by thinking about, well, you know, what is an agent's beliefs and, and desires? So like, how do they value the different outcomes? So this is a way we're building a rich model of intention into this kind of BDI, inverse BDI type of uh, uh, model. So where the theory of mind is, again, going backwards using, using Bayes' rule. In particular, we build in a bunch of different interesting kinds, I think they're cognitively plausible kinds of priors that allow us to do, rap that, allow, that we think allow people to do very uh, rapid inference from little data. So for example, what's the probability that someone actually wants to, like, wants to kill one of the agents? Very low. Um, uh, what's the, is there some kind of cost of just entering by making a decision, like an omission or a default of getting involved? Yeah, but it's gonna be very small, really kind of just breaking symmetries. And then we're gonna have, for the kind of different case studies I'm going to show you, different kind of norms and, and uh, preferences that we're going to also build in, and I'll, I'll show you how, what those look like right now. So again, one of the challenges is that what's permissible is often um, hard to, depends a lot on the context. So imagine it's the decision maker and their brother is now on the sidetrack. So, and they let the train go and kill the five people. You might think, tragic, but Understandable. We, you know, think about the first part of the talk. Love one. We might. It might be okay to value your loved ones more than a, than an arbitrary person. Well, but what about this case? Well, they flip the switch and kill the brother, saving the five people. Also, probably permissible in some way. Um, maybe the person's hyper moral. You know, they just really believe all value people are valued equally. So this is again, we're kind of taking that framework we talked about before. When you see this action, you're not just doing the intention inference because you don't know the utilities of the decision maker. You're doing inference over what their values are, which set those, set those, uh, which set the, the the utilities in the uh, influence diagram. So in the case where they let it go, you might think, oh, the value of the brother is very high. That's b greater greater than one. When they're doing it equal to when they're letting the person die, die you, you would just you wouldn't say, oh, they intended to kill the brother necessarily, but rather, oh, they probably just value all life equally. Okay, so, and, and so you get the right intention in both cases, and so you make the right moral permissibility judgment. All right, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna go kind of quick here, but the important thing is this is a quantitative framework. We can make precise predictions about people's judgments. So here's a case which is a little bit more interesting. So in this case, the brother's on the main track, you flip it, well, it's definitely gonna be about saving the brother. And again, that's what people think. They think this is permissible, even though there's no net difference in lives saved. They think the intention was to not kill, and the intention was to save, uh, was not to kill, Sorry, the intention was to not kill the brother, and the intention was, and there was no intention to kill the, per, not the stranger who died. And people made the inference that this decision maker valued loved ones more than, than, than others. That was the way we phrased the question. And what I'm showing you in blue and red, red is the data and blue is the model. But now consider this case, where it's one versus one, and you flip the switch. Well, now this is a little bit weird. Yeah, again, it's the same, same net utility, but it's hard to explain this in terms of the values that we talked about, right? This is like, well, maybe this person really wants to kill their brother. So again, we see this you know, sharp decrease in the moral permissibility. It looks like this person, people make the inferences that this person has an intention to kill. Uh, the values flip. Um, and then the cool thing about these trolley problems is that we can just generate all kinds of different procedurally, parametrically varying versions of them. And our model captures a lot of the fine-grained structure of both of how people make moral permissibility judgments as well as the intention inferences they make. Okay. And that's true for both when the agent threw the switch, that's what I'm showing you here, as well as they omitted an action, they didn't make any choice. And again, our model explains quite a bit of, a large amount of the variance in, in people's judgments. Okay. In that case, there was only a single choice, flip or no flip. But a trivial way in which intentions depend, so, so okay, let me first describe this scenario. So in this scenario, there's a second track, this is called the side-side track. This is a, so we're really innovating here. We're adding a second choice. The agent has to flip, in order for, to get the train onto this, they have to flip this switch and this switch. Okay. So you, but you only observe the agent's first action. So again, you have to infer what their future intention is. So, um, and this is a trivial way in which permissibility has to depend on intentionality because without being able to infer the future intention, you've no way even knowing what the outcome is. Like if they flip the first switch, are five gonna die or are none gonna die? You don't know. Okay, so here's our representation. And 
uh, in this particular case, again, the model makes the right inferences that if you threw the first switch and you have the kind of the default prior values, you're likely to flip the second switch, which means you don't have intention to kill, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and it's morally permissible. But we can, because we're dealing with, we're using influence diagrams, this, and they naturally allow us to deal with um, uncertainty. So what if there's some probability that that switch is broken? Okay. So point four, well, if you flip the first switch, is that a good idea? Well, if you're just a utility maximizer, you're, you could have had one guy die for sure, or two die in expectation. So, but what inference do you make? Do you make this, this person probably wants to kill those five people, this is a bad person? Maybe it's not, maybe, but maybe there's also the possibility that this person just, they'd rather save everybody than let one guy die for sure. Take a chance on, on saving everybody, right? So there may be their risk seeking. And so when we add that as a possibility, so just you know, putting a prior over kind of a very basic risk parameter um, and allow that to be inferred based on just the single action, we capture both judgments about risk as well as why this, in, this action in particular may not be, is judged still as to be relatively highly uh, permissible. Again, parametric, we can scale, do this in many different ways. Uh, people uh, in the model align quite closely uh, for many different scenarios, just kind of give you some gestalt data analysis here. And the last one is a case where intentions are complicated because it's possible to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. This is uh, insight from Scanlon, who's a philosopher here at Harvard uh, in one of his recent books in Moral Dimensions. And here now imagine the decision maker is the CEO of the train company and the big bag of money is supposed to mean this like very valuable piece of equipment for the train company. So in some sense, like he did the right thing, he did the thing we'd all probably do, but did he really do it to save the people or did he do it to save the equipment? And you can play around with this, right? So in this case, it's very clear, well, he's just trying to save the money, but he's not doing it because he wants to kill anybody. It's just about the money, right? And then likewise here, well, maybe that's okay because you know, money has some value, but maybe it's a little bit weird. He's not demonstrating the right values, okay. So again, we can kind of add this additional component of utility to our influence diagrams. I'm gonna blow through this pretty quickly. Same approach applies. What are the inferences? When lives are on the line, do only lives matter or trade-offs can be made between resources and lives? Uh, this is the case of doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. But again, you infer that it, was, it still wasn't done because either with an intention to kill. I'm just gonna, I don't wanna take people's over. Another parametric study, lots of data. Model makes predictions that are close to the people. Here's across all the three scenarios. We compare this to a model that doesn't have any of the structure. It's just a regression model. And our model explains a large degree of the held out variance in this data set, while these other, uh, a model that doesn't capture any of the structure of uh, moral permissibility and how it depends on intention does not. Okay, just gonna end here. These are, this is some of uh, the work I talked about in this talk. Um, what I showed, I hope, was that this idea of the latent mental states of others, intentions, moral values, impartiality, they can all be models of a kind of Bayesian theory of mind where you're making inferences about representations that others have that are unobserved and you're making those inferences based on the actions that they take. The cognitive implication is that we have a model of other agents that we use to make those inferences. And then by, uh, by analogy, then, if we want to build agents with human-like capabilities to make these kinds of inferences, judgments, and decisions, they also need to be endowed with that notion of the agency of others. And by, by grounding moral rules and, and broadly in these intuitive theories, we're able to predict a lot of the fine-grained structure of how moral judgment, moral learning, and fairness all work together. Uh, so thank you uh, to everyone here. <laughs>